Good morning. Welcome to Market Street on this first Sunday of Advent. That was a powerful message just to begin with. There was one line in it that stuck with me. Each morning, we have to choose. We choose hope. Wow, it's a choice. It's not choosing something that's, uh, that is fleeting, but it's something in the future. Having something to hang our hat on. And today, we're going to continue to see how we choose Jesus Christ and choose the eternal. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and Jesus is our hope. Join with me as we pray. Precious God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this season of Advent, this season of hope as we look back at the past of how you gave us your son Jesus and was there at creation and is the eternal, the yet to come. He came for the first coming and has prepared a place for us, the second coming. And so we place our hope in you. So, Lord, as we prepare our homes, we prepare baking, we prepare gifts, help us to prepare differently than we ever have before. Help us to prepare spiritually. Help us to think differently of the blessings, the ways that you have given us many things, but most of all, your son. So, Lord, prepare Help us to be intentional this year to prepare our hearts, minds, spirits for you to unwrap the gift of Jesus and hope in a new way. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for Jesus. Help us to think of hope and open it each day in a new way. We offer this, our whole mind selves, this morning in, in the precious name of your Son and the family of God said, Amen. We have endured these past few years and know that there is more to face before us. We don't know if we have the strength to withstand what might be around the next corner. And we wonder, who will stand with us? Who will have our back? Who will occupy our corner? Who is with us? That is what we begin to wonder these days. Who will light our way and chart our course? Who is on our side, and who will welcome us home again? Home. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of a branch that will be raised. Jesus spoke of a son of man that will descend. Both point to a hope, a hope that calls us home, our true home, where we're, we're welcomed and loved and included where there is justice and equality and peace, it's time, this Advent season, time to go home. We light this candle as a sign of our hope our strong hope that there is a way to go home, to the home in Christ, and it starts with us. And it starts here, and it starts now. It is time to go home.
Let us all stand for our gathering hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I want to say it's a busy week, but that's what I say every week. <laughs> I can't figure that out. But yet, of course, if you've gotten the Harbinger, feel like we just put one out, but there's another one coming out this week because uh, it's already December this week. But Immediately following church, we have our tree already put up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, decorate the, church, uh, the tree and a few other spaces and places within the church. So if you're able to help out, that would be wonderful. And each week, more and more will uh, come about from the poinsettias arriving, etc. So it'll kind of... Every week we want you to be wowed, so it'll be fun that way. Um, in addition, tomorrow morning, lights on the lawn. Uh, the church has a tree for the Onancock Business and Civic Association. So we had a tree last year. We'll have another tree. I think it's going to be tree surprise. Uh, I asked Wayne what our theme was and what our decorations were, and he said, we'll see what shows up. So it's tree surprise. <laughs> Last year he had a certain theme, so we're going to see what the decorations are necessarily. But if you're able to help out, we're going to. It'll be a much nicer day. Today's rainy. Tomorrow we should have a nicer day. So um, if you're able to help decorate that. Um, that being said, on Friday night. One of our goals for being the church in vision and mission was to continue being into the community, sharing who we are and what we do. And on Friday night, we are um, serving hot chocolate to the community um, at the tree lighting. So the tree lighting, it will, they'll light those trees at 6 p.m. We're going to be out there at 5.30. Mike and Mary our uh, Massey and Diana Lumley are going to be out there and anybody else who would like to come out uh, and help us serve hot chocolate, hand out our trifold. What a great witness for us to um, give a, a cup of refreshment in the name of Jesus. So that is uh, a busy week um, and I will add a plug for the madrigals today. So Lisa, Lane, 
Tyler are all at the Madrigal. So what is that? Somebody tell me. I think I say that correctly, but uh, if somebody wants to give a highlight of what that is. December the 2nd, around 7. And that's in Exmoor. Yes. And then in Snow Hill, I can't think of the name of the church. All but Hallows. All Hallows Church in Snow Hill on Sunday at 2, December the 4th. Okay. So Friday night in Exmoor and at 7 p.m. And Sunday, I think it's 2.30 at the Episcopal Church in Snow Hill. And it's $15 for tickets. Oh, it's $15. So they're... Okay, so there is a fee to get in. Okay, so if you want to support those folks, that would be wonderful as well. So it's exciting to see the way our uh, uh, disciples are out in ministry and uh, moving forward, sharing their talents. So um, a few prayer updates. Melinda is recovering uh, with her... Uh, gallbladder surgery, had a small infection, so now she's trying to recover from the antibiotics on that side. Um, Tony's fall, really bad break, uh, and now she's going to be having surgery on Wednesday at the Riverside Surgical Center in Williamsburg. Not only did she just break here, but she's done damage to the shoulder socket, so she's going to be getting a shoulder replacement. So she, um, she, when she did it, she did it right, or did it well, or did it bad, all of the above. So lots of prayer. I think um, Lane has been her right-hand man. Wouldn't you say that, Lane? That's pretty good, huh? You're her right-hand man, because she did her right hand. She uh, hurt her right arm, so she is her uh, on that side. So, um, so this morning we're going to be reading from Romans 15 for prayer time as we uh, journey this Advent season. What a beautiful picture! How many of you have seen the geese going south already? Wow. <laughs> well, they're going somewhere. I just see them. Maybe they're just confused. <laughs> but let's go to prayer time. Accept each other just as Christ accepted you so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came so that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. That is what the psalmist meant when he wrote, For this, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing praises to your name. And in another place it is written, Rejoice with his people, you Gentiles. And yet again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Praise him, all you people of the earth. In another place, Isaiah said, The heir to David's throne will come. He will rule over the Gentiles. He will place their, they will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will find you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with that confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Amen, God. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
God of hope, of new life. All of our times are in your hands. We thank you and praise you for the, you are the Lord of our yesterdays, our todays, our tomorrows. In you, the old is redeemed and everything has become new. Lord Jesus, hope overcomes, hope heals, hope restores, hope inspires, hope conquers, hope frees. Hope is your gift to the world. We come to you this morning as a people saddened by the violence and conflict we've witnessed in the streets, in the Walmarts of our country. We know from your word that you created us in your image, that you show no partiality, that by your, the blood of your son, you've ransomed a people unto yourself from every tribe, language, people, and nation on the earth. We know that racism, bigotry, and hatred are absolutely against what Jesus came for, represent the work of Satan seeking to divide us. It is in times like this We're tempted to give up hope, to believe that grieving will not end. But Lord, your scriptures tell us that we have hope because of that you have victory. And we serve a God of hope. And so this morning we put our hope in you, Lord. We pray for peace, not false peace that comes from weeping and problems, but lasting peace. Give our leaders wisdom and restraint. We pray, God, that you would, in your mercy, end the trials and tribulations that we see on this earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We come this morning that you would bring comfort, healing to the many on our hearts and that we would draw near to you in this season of Advent. Prepare us differently. We come now with our own intercessions, petitions, prayers. We begin with ourselves. We can only change us, but we bring our families. We bring our loved ones. We bring this church, this community, this country, this world before you. Hear us now, whether we pray out loud or in the quietness of our hearts.
those scriptures as a reminder before us. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord, where we're weak, be our strength. Where we're lost, be our light. Help us to shine bright for your glory in these tri trials and tribulations. And now, as your disciples today, we say those words you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we begin a new sermon series from the Scrooge. I don't even need to say much more. But here's a trivia qu question for you. James Earl Jones. Jim Carrey, Patrick Stewart, and Bill Murray. What if I add George C. Scott, Cecily Tyson, Tom Hanks? Mm, one more hint. Scrooge McDuck. Hmm. What do all of them have in common? <laughs> They've all played Scrooge. And so our sermon series for, and where we'll, what we will use for this uh, season is A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And so today we will be looking at Christmas past and then we will have Christmas present and future We'll even have a wonderful rendition of a Market Street version of A Christmas Carol on December 11th. I promise you, our Scrooge, well, I won't tell you who. You won't want to miss it, and in fact, you might really want to invite some friends for the wonderful choir's version of The Christmas Carol. Most definitely. But we're going to use some scripture this morning to lead us and guide us to the past to see how Scrooge might have a connection to that. So let's start with Matthew. So Matthew 1, 16 and 17. Jacob was the father of Joseph and the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Also, those listed above include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the ba Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. So that's how Matthew begins the story of um, the Christmas story. Of course, you can never find the Christmas story if you're going to look for it in one spot. I was always really confused about that. Many of you know I came from a Catholic background. I went to go look for the Christmas story. And you need to get Matthew, Mark, Luke. Those three give you the details. And John gives you the uh, spiritual version. But to get the details of the story, you get all of it in different spots. And so you start getting the lineage of um, Joseph and that in Matthew and that's so Matthew is where we start and it helps us be the bridge to the Old Testament and so 
those who are Jewish are going to understand Jacob and Abraham and all of those pieces. So that's really important. And so uh, I find that to be interesting. And so Joseph has to look, you look back at Joseph, and that's the first part that we understand with Scrooge. Scrooge is, uh, in the story, many of you, how many have seen Scrooge and know what that's all about, and Dickens, and so he's a miserly businessman, he's visited by three ghosts, he definitely isn't living a life that's, um, you know, blessing many people, and he's got, gotten a chance to look back. So why is that important? Let's look at this Jacob and Abraham and David. Well, it's said that um, there's many of the folks in the Old Testament or throughout were all had, an, had different uh, issues. Here it says Jacob. Now, the Jacob that is Joseph's father is not the same Jacob that's mentioned here. There's many that are listed as Jacob. That Jacob was a cheater. Joseph's father what isn't the same Jacob. But David, we all know, had the affair with Bathsheba. And down below, that Abraham was a liar. That, you know, he uh, didn't always say and do this right thing. So Joseph has a lineage of Old Testament folks that had history. That didn't always do what they said they would do. So we all have a past. So way before Joseph comes on the scene as to become the father of uh, Mary and Joseph to become the father of Jesus, he, he comes with family baggage. How many of you have family baggage? Or how many of your family baggage was swept under the carpet and you'd never really wanted to learn about it? Hmm. So we all have some family baggage. And in fact, um, Scripture says in Exodus 34, 7, Scripture says God passed in front of Moses and called out, God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sins. He holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sins to the third and how, and how much to the fourth generation? Whoa, wait a minute. So how many of you knew what your grandparents did? Your pa grandparents, great-grandparents. And uh, this is, is important to me. So when I, um, when I was little, uh, you know, my mom, you've heard me talk about my parents a little bit. My mom had me when she was younger, but I would tell you my mom never really wanted to be a mom. She had me when she was 18, and she had me, which, thank you, Jesus. Um, but she, then she went on to have five, chil five children. Um, but there was many times we got locked out outside, had to play. We could come home for lunch, come in for lunch, but we were locked outside all day long. And she never, she sat inside and read a book. She never wanted to be a mom. Um, and I'm going to tell you a true story. When I brought home um, somebody that I was dating, I found my mom made out with that person. Sick stuff. Sick things. And um, then when, you know, my mom died at 42 and somewhere in there, you know, but she never really wanted to be a mom. When I, so she died before I had any of my children. Um, but her mother was always living, and when my mom died, she, that grandmother never came and helped us five kids that were at home. My dad was an alcoholic, and um, we were kind of left out by ourselves, and um, that was very confusing, but, and that grandmother only lived a few miles away, and, uh, I've come to learn that my mom, that generational sin was being handed down. When I became, a, a really grew into, I said, I'm not, I'm going to break that generational curse. 
I wanted to be the best mom and grandmom I could ever be. When I got pregnant uh, with my first child, I called that grandmother who didn't live far away. I said, I got great news. You're going to be a great gra a grandma. This is your first child. She goes, that's not great news to me. True story. She ended it. That grandmother, uh, her other two children were living. She mo went on, moved on along, moved to Florida. She ended up having surgery and dying on the operating table. And her daughter never knew. We never saw her again. That is not good news to me. So when you see me, I have a car that's only a brand new car. It's seven weeks old, uh, eight weeks old now. And I have 7,000 miles on it already because I've gone to soccer, field hockey, uh, all those things to be there for grandkids because, you know, that's how it will be. But being on the Eastern Shore puts me in the middle of my grandkids. So generational curses, and I said, I will break that. I will break that. And so there's still things that haunt me today, and I'm going to share those with you. It's a day that I can only share with you what I know personally. So there's some things that my mom did or said to me that still haunt me, and I'll share with that. So, so Scrooge had to look back. So this has been a sermon that's had me looking back, and as I was putting you know, things on a tree yesterday, it, it was very reflective. So um, Joseph had a, a past history, and I know he wanted to become a better man than some of those people in his past history. So how do we know this? Let's look at this scripture, and let's see how we know Joseph wanted to be a better man than what Jacob was, because Jacob was a cheater, you know, some, and David, some, let's see how we know that. So let's look at Matthew 18 to 21, the next verses. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Let me show you what it is. So, let me show you. And so he, deci he decided, do you see that word? So he decided to break the engagement quietly. Joseph made a choice. Joseph was a righteous man. He chose every one of us on a daily basis, are haunted by things from the past that want to come back on a regular basis. And so they come back and haunt us. And let me share with you what, what I mean. My mother, you know, I understand and I've come to learn. So I started working at the Federal Reserve Bank when I was a senior in high school. And I was buying clothes because I was working. And I'd come back home from school or from work, and I'd be looking for my clothes. Now I'd find them in the bottom of my closet, dirty. She was wearing my clothes. Oh, well, they fit me better than you. So when I think about things that haunt me, she would say, well, she would be dealing with She'd be smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee, trying to be thin. What haunts me is she'd say, well, you're a little overweight. So there are things that haunt me, and I feel like that's my mom nagging at me. And I know I'm not that, but I hear it. 
It's a skeleton in my closet. Do you have them? And you know they're not it. But you can be darn sure I made sure my children, my daughters, and my granddaughters, I do not want them carrying those skeletons. But we have them. Can you hear somebody telling you that you weren't good enough, you can't do that, or other things like that? We have them. Whether we like them or not, they come back to haunt you, good or bad. It is. But you see, we can't be a prisoner of our past. They're just lessons in this life. But let me, I'm going to share one more thing. And I don't know why God's taking me down this road. So now I was married nearly for 40 years. Then how does your ex-husband find a 29-year-old girl that's a, looked like a, somebody from a penthouse magazine and then again made me, makes you not feel like you're worthy? But again, that skeleton in your closet. And I continually have to find my worth in Jesus Christ. And that my hope is who I am in Jesus, not who I am in Heidi. So when somebody says about divorce or any of those things, I can just say, I understand. I understand. I'm not exempt in any way, shape, or form. And there's nothing I want more than family that, that is together. And what hurt me the most this weekend was my oldest daughter said, well, when you chose divorce, you took away my core family unit. I didn't choose it, dear. But what do you think she did? Didn't come. That's the way it is. But I have to find my peace, my joy, my hope in Jesus. We're not exempt, folks. But we walk with Jesus every day. And that's how it works. And so these are real. And I was struggling really bad. Everybody left at, at Thanksgiving. They, everybody went back, and here's this big empty house. I said, Jesus, we've got to find a way through this. So I had to put the, the decorations up to find that way. And so it wasn't, this sermon wasn't by accident. And Jesus said, that's not what defined you. That isn't what defined you. It's a lesson. And so we can't change our past, folks. In fact, I can't change how anybody acts. I can only change me. I can only change me. I can change my attitude. I can find joy every day. And my hope is in Jesus Christ. My blessings are in Christ. So in Christ alone, my hope is found. I hope you'll live and pray and understand that as well. He's my life, my strength, my hope. He's my all in all. None of us has a perfect past. The people before us have skeletons. They handed down from generation to generation. We get it physically with our uh, genetics. No matter whether it's cancer, whether it's, uh, we can talk to Dr. Tom about our genetics. You can try to do the best eating you can, but you're still going to get the high cholesterol, whatever else, from your genetics. It's the way it is. So our genetics and all the rest. So there's a web. So we can't change those genetics. It's what it comes. But that web, we can't change that past. But we do get to change and allow it to not shape who we are. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. I can promise you that you can find peace because of that. May you know that today. Amen.
see. Somehow Michelle does it every single week. I didn't even know what the name of the song was today. She does it every week. I should know that God is faithful. But yet again, uh, I just share that we bring offering. I thank everyone for bringing their time, talent, and treasures. And we put offering in the plate in the back. And there's been so many ways from, what was the final count for the shoeboxes that came to, we delivered them last week, right? We had uh, 179. Okay, <laughs> right. 173 t actual boxes and six online boxes, right? Okay. So what a way to, of offering. And uh, the men almost, so lots of ways that we've been giving and offering. And there is the angel tree downstairs. Stairs, so this church has been giving in so many ways. Thank you for all of that. There are the plates in the back. And so this church is a very generous church. Thank you, thank you for all you do. So join with me in this uh, Advent uh, offering prayer. Join with me. God of the Advent, as we joyfully enter this time of waiting, we wait hushed in anticipation of the coming of your Son. He serves as the guide of our lives and the shepherd of our souls. We hope to emulate his generosity and compassion as we share these gifts. Use these gifts so others can be blanketed with the warmth of your unconditional love. Like a newborn baby wrapped in the loving arms of a parent. Amen. Let's all stand for the doxology. Closing hymn, Angels from the Realm of Glory, number 220.
I opened worship with the thought that hope is a choice to be made every day. And I close with the thought that hope is a choice to be made every day. But hope in Jesus Christ is where we put it. May you know that hope in the powerful name of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have a blessed and powerful Holy Week. Amen. Thank you.